Hello there. Uh, another section on stratification. In one of the earlier sections where we talked about W. Lloyd Warner's 1940s study and updated it with current material, asked the question, uh, you know, why is wealth distributed the way it is? And we get two very different answers from different sociologists. Some sociologists are much more what we call politically conservative, much more on the right, meaning that uh, they're functionalists, according to your book's uh, uh, argument. Functionalists argue that society is a relatively stable set of parts, that things fit together for the greater good, that it's evolved over time to meet basic needs, and that the reason some people have more money is because they're worth more than other people to the society, is an essential argument. Other people are conflict theorists. And I tend to lean in this direction, kind of a combination of the two. They're both extreme arguments. But conflict theorists argue that society is rigged, that it's set up so that the power elite, see Wright Mill's word, the power elite are able to pass laws that keep them rich and keep poor people poor. That's a profound thought. So let's take a look at both of these arguments. One of the arguments we'll start with, the argument we'll start with is the functionalist argument. This is the conservative one, and it argues that like an inch and all these parts are interrelated, and uh, it makes a series of arguments here. It says, number one, some jobs are more important than other jobs. Would you agree with that? Well, come to mind, you think about your kid being sick, and you go to, you know, he's got a tumor in the brain, you go to a brain surgeon, you know, that's awfully important to you at that moment, that that brain surgeon be highly trained, and it takes a lot of time, and so forth. And um, so it makes some sense. The second part of this is these jobs require highly specialized training. So the person is out of the workplace, not making money, in fact, maybe going into debt. The average medical doctor here at the university in Springfield is about $100,000 in debt when he or she gets out at the end of that time. So would you agree with this one? Now keep in mind, we're kind of doing a tight logic here, and if you don't object at each stage, pretty soon you're going to have a conclusion you're, you're stuck with. And we'll go back and critique that. Some jobs are more important than other jobs. These jobs require highly specialized training. And number two, only a limited number of people have the skills to even do these jobs. Let's say can't acquire the skills. Now think about this one. Is that true? Let's use the brain surgeon example again. Could I be a brain surgeon? Am I smart enough to be a brain surgeon? Maybe. But I don't know if you've noticed on the camera yet, but my eyes wiggle, my head shakes, I have fine motor coordination. You prob problems, you probably wouldn't want me digging in there with a scoop in your brain. I'd be trying to take out uh, some minor part of the hypothalamus and scoop out your amygdala and you'd be like a vegetable for the rest of your life. So I would be one person who would not have the skills to be a brain surgeon. I may have the skills to be a college teacher, but I don't have the skills to be a brain surgeon. All right, number three, learning these skills take years of special training. In time, you're out of the marketplace. Keep in mind we're doing the functionalist argument here. All right, think about a brain surgeon. They go to school four years of bachelor's, probably another four years to six years of a general practitioner, and then they're practicing and specializing and it may be another four or eight years of specialization training. So a tremendous amount of training, ongoing training all their life trying to keep up with it. And then the fourth point is that to get people to go through all this pain, to get this special training, what do you got to do to motivate it? 
motivation to do this equals what? What do we have to offer people? They say the class stuff, power, prestige, and money. In other words, the ability to have a lifestyle the average one of us can't afford. So that this is the carrot at the end of the walkway, that they go through all kinds of mazes and hard work that, that some of the rest of the population doesn't go through, and they may have special abilities to begin with, and we need to reward these people to work that hard. Okay? So what's the next conclusion probably going to be? Uh, if we look, at, we look at this idea, we've got to give them high rewards. These monies are going to be money, power, prestige. So number five is going to be this leads to social inequality. Therefore, dot, 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 that's what that means, three dots. Therefore, social inequality is what? According to this argument, is functional, is good. It works to motivate people, according to this argument, and therefore, it exists in all societies. All right, what do you agree with on this argument? What don't you agree with? Hmm, remember the conflict people are saying, wait a minute, there's something wrong with this argument, that we've got people rigging the system, some people getting access to education so they can get these special jobs that other people don't even have access to, that there are special tax breaks, that there are all kinds of things the American Medical Association has done to make this a very prestigious position way beyond what it should be. This will be a conflict argument. So the first argument says, We've got people with special training. These, everybody can't do it. You've got to offer them high rewards. These high rewards are status, lifestyle, money. Therefore, inequality is functional. Well, it's such a nice, tight-sounding argument. But the conflict people say there's something seriously wrong with the argument. So let's look at conflict. Maybe I should have a red magic marker up here instead of a, a green one for conflict. That, that might uh, <laughs> illustrate a little bit better. The conflict people make several arguments, and, and they look at and they said, number one, there is no objective measure showing one job is more important. than another. And their argument is like this. They say, okay, now we talk about doctors saving lives. They say, obviously that's important if my child's sick, I'm sick, my wife's sick. But who's saved the most lives over time? It's been sanitation workers and people designing sewage systems. They don't get lots of prestige. They don't get nearly the power that doctors have, and they save far more lives. Why don't we honor them? Why don't we motivate them? Uh, if you go back to a hundred years ago in Europe and America, there were many places where feces, blood, urine, everything imaginable was running rampant in the streets. They just dumped things in little, little mud ditches. They didn't understand the importance of germs. Once you got that under control, this massive urban health improvement, then lives started being saved by the hundreds of thousands. And it wasn't the medical profession that did that directly. It was another group of people who are not paid nearly as highly. Uh, most of you aren't old enough to remember this, but I remember a garbage strike in New York City. Now, union garbage men, or in women, most of them are men, some of them get paid reasonable wages, but they're not paid like medical doctors. Uh, they have very hard, back-breaking work. They went on strike in New York City. You know what happened? Well, garbage piled two and three stories high. Rats came back. And you know what the rats brought? Bubonic plague. So the lowly garbage worker who's breaking his back day in and day out may not be paying, been paid much at all, maybe in that upper lower class or lower middle class, one of the two, he or she really is doing a lot to save lives and it's a very humble profession. But of course, there's not lots of training, but it is very important. What about the healthcare worker that's not paid much? What about the fireman 
or fire woman who, uh, firefighter who risks his or her life like, day in and day out to save people aren't paid much at all compared to medical doctors. Why did medical doctors get so much money? Well, if we go into this a little deeper, there's a fascinating book called The Social Transformation of American Medicine, and it shows how the AMA, American Medical Association, operated as a very functional union. And they managed to take the idea of, of being uh, a profession of helping people to one that was of a great prestige. You might be surprised by this, but the word doctor never was related to medicine until the, they made it connected. They took the PhD from Europe and said, that's a high status name, let's call ourselves doctors. And now they're the only ones who get to call themselves doctors. All right, so that's a, there's a problem with one argument here. The second point that the conflict people make is that many qualified people get squeezed out of the ability to get these good jobs. And what I've written here is that many qualified people just don't even get on the high track. And a lot of that has to do with uh, how, what kind of education they get, the quality of education, the quality of science education, personal choice. Uh, this year, graduating from medical school or, or starting medical school, I think uh, over 50% of the people starting are female. When I was a, a kid, it was like 80 or 90% of the people starting medical school were male. Females had a heck of a time getting in, were socialized to believe they couldn't do it, and in fact there's lots of evidence to show that, that many women bring very special qualities to a health care situation. Um, so if you're talking about uh, African Americans, or you're talking about women, or you're talking about minority groups who lack access to power, prestige, and money, they're less likely to be able to get on that high track to those good paying jobs. Of course, that's where affirmative action has come in, lots of controversy, whether that's good or bad, uh, and that's a very difficult decision. All right? The third point they make, the third point they make in this argument is that the rewards that we give to some professions are way out of proportion to how much they contribute to society. real contributions to society. In an earlier video, I had mentioned that in 1960, you know, the average CEO, chief executive officer, made 41 times what the average factory worker made. And, and that didn't seem unreasonable to me, but by 1997, that had risen to 360 sometimes. Uh, that seems very unreasonable. And by the way, that did not happen in, in Europe, and it didn't happen among CEOs in Japan. That's fairly unique to the United States. So that they get their hands on power, and they enhance their prestige. They enhance their power. Uh, that we ought to pay fire, firefighters more than we pay them, and maybe we ought to pay some uh, plastic surgeons who primarily do breast lifts less. Who knows? That's one of their arguments in conflict theory at any rate. Uh, number four, if you're looking at what motivates people, think about what motivates you. We all are fixated on money in America, but when we look at real motivation, research shows us something very clear. Lack of money can make us unhappy. The presence of more and more money doesn't necessarily make us happy. Are motivated to do a better job. So real motivation comes from what kinds of things? Pride in your work, the ability to be independent, the ability to have input in an organization. Those are the things that motivate people to want to do a good job. Most people want to do a good job. And we don't, therefore, have to, to offer these huge amount of rewards uh, to get people motivated. If you look at many countries, we have lots of medical doctors who make almost the same salaries as average everyday people. Why do they still get motivated to go to school? Because they love learning. They love helping people. It's not just the money that motivates. And finally, the conflict point of view argues, number five, this great inequality. We see far more inequality in some South American countries, for example, than in America. But this great inequality leads 
to hostility. Um, and conflict between the classes. And when the, the disparity gets so great, they argue that down the road we all need to worry because some people get tired of this after a while, tired of not having a piece of the pie, and it can lead to the downfall of civilization. Kind of shocking to think about. So why don't you compare and contrast the conflict point of view with the functionalist point of view? You can believe either and have great sociologists who would back you up, but you might find some combination between the two if you're thinking about how to put those two together. You might be able to buy ideas from both sides. Thanks.